In introducing today's program and presenters on Oregon's initiative system, I thought it might be enlightening to see where our Benson Hotel City Club audience stands on the use of the initiative. Uh, now that you uh, have your voting arms warmed up, I'm going to ask for a quick show of hands on one of three perspectives on the initiative that I'll describe momentarily. Guests in the audience are welcome to participate, and members of the radio audience, please don't let go of the wheel of the car if you're driving to raise your hand, but feel free to drop us a postcard uh, if you'd like to register your vote. The question is, is this, which of the following three statements comes closest to reflecting your view about use of the initiative in Oregon? A, I believe exercise of the initiative option is important. When I encounter a petitioner on the street, I most always stop to hear the story and more often than not will sign the petition, feeling that Oregonians should have a chance to vote on the question. B, I'm cautious about use of the initiative option. I don't often stop to listen to a petitioner and sign the initiative only when the issue seems critical to me personally. C, I feel the initiative option is being overused and almost always pass on the opportunity to sign a petition. Just quickly then for a show of hands, how many feel that A comes closest uh, in which uh, they most always stop to hear the story and more often than not will sign the petition? Okay, thank you. B, I'm cautious about use of the initiative. I don't often stop to listen and I'll sign the petition only when the issue seems critical to me. Okay, thank you. And C, I feel the initiative options being overused, and I almost always pass on the opportunity to sign the petition. Oh, we've got some differences of opinion here and some challenges for our speakers. Our speakers today uh, are two gentlemen who are both very familiar to city club audiences. Oregon Secretary of State Phil Kiesling is midway through his first elected term after appointment to the post in January 1991. A graduate of Beaverton Sunset High School and Yale University, Phil has served as state representative of House District 12, which at the time straddled southeast and southwest Portland. His careers in politics and journalism stretch back to speech writing for former Governor Tom McCall and include stints as a reporter for Willamette Week, editor of the Washington Monthly Magazine in the nation's capital, and aide to uh, Vera Katz as former House, when she was former House Speaker. Currently on his agenda are, as Secretary of State are efforts to increase voter registration and turnout, reform campaign finance, improve the management of state-owned lands, expand community service by Oregonians, and increase performance auditing of government programs. Charles Hinkle, our other speaker, is a member of the City Club and a former president of this organization in the late 1980s. A partner in the Portland law firm of Stoll, Reeves, Boley, Jones, and Gray, Charlie is a member of the Board of Governors of the Oregon State Bar, a former president of the ACLU of Oregon, and a former board member of the National ACLU. Mr. Hinkle is adjunct professor of constitutional law at Lewis and Clark Law School. He's a recipient of the ACLU's E.B. McNaughton Award and of the Elliott Human Rights Award from the Oregon Education Association. Charlie will address us first on the effect of the current use of the initiative, including the impact on certain democratic values and our Republican form of government. He'll also talk about the apparent conflict between civil liberties and the populist tradition. Phil will place the initiative in its historical context, drawing parallels to past times of social and economic change and offering his views on the current state of the initiative. Both of our speakers plan to offer us some proposals for change. Please join me in welcoming Secretary of State Phil Kiesling and Charles Hinkle back to the City Club. Thank you, Don. When Oregon's experience with the initiative was 10 years old in 1912, a book was published called The Oregon System and it began with these two contrary views of that first decade's experience. 
first the author wrote this paragraph. How would you like to live in a state where the people can enact laws for the common good, which the legislature has failed to enact for them, where they can nullify any obnoxious measure passed by the legislature, a state where the party boss has been put out of business, a state, in short, where the people rule. Such a state is Oregon. And then secondly, the author wrote this. How would you like to live in a state where the people can amend their constitution in the most radical fashion by minority vote? Where 1 20th of the voters can and do cripple the state educational institutions by holding up their funds? Where men representing themselves as for the people buy signatures for so much per name in order to get measures on the ballot? A state where the demagogue thrives and the energetic crank with money can, through the initiative, legislate to his heart's content. Oregon is such a state. <laughs> well, isn't it remarkable to think that those words were written 82 years ago? And while probably all of us sympathize, would like to agree with the first of those two paragraphs, there is enough truth in the second to cause many of us to temper our enthusiasm for this experiment in direct democracy. Direct democracy is, of course, not part of our federal constitution, and there's good reason for that. One of the fundamental purposes of the constitution was to safeguard individual liberty against all forms of tyranny, and the framers believed that direct democracy would be likely to lead to tyranny, tyranny of the majority, majority dictatorship. Because when the people as a whole vote on laws, there are few checks on the temptation to sacrifice minority interests or to disadvantage unpopular causes or individuals. James Madison said it best. Pure democracy, he wrote, can admit of no cure for the mischiefs of faction. A common passion or interest will, in almost every case, be felt by the majority and there is nothing to check the inducements to sacrifice the weaker party. So, Madison and his colleagues created a federal government based not on direct democracy, but on Republican principles of representative government. They believed that representative government, for all its faults, would at least promote some degree of deliberation and compromise of competing interests. And they didn't stop at the national level. They knew that tyranny of the majority would be a threat at the state level as well, so they included in the Constitution a clause that says, the United States shall guarantee to every state a Republican form of government. Well, after 90 years of experience with the initiative in Oregon, what can we say about Madison's theories? Is the direct popular vote compatible with reasoned, deliberate judgments? Or is it subject, as Madison feared it would be, subject to what he called the common passion of the majority? I want to bring to your attention three episodes in Oregon's history that may shed some light on this problem. In the late 1850s, 1850s now, after years of debate in Congress over the question of whether slavery should be allowed in the Western territories, a proposal was made in Oregon to bar free black Americans from living in our state. The territorial legislature refused to enact the law, but there was such groundswell of opinion for it that the legislature finally decided to call for an advisory vote by the people as a whole on this question. Shall free black people be permitted to live in Oregon? That was the substance of the question presented to the voters in 1857. And it was approved by them by a margin of more than eight to one. Why? Because black people, of course, are different from us. They represent a threat to our way of life. That was direct democracy in action, and it produced a testament to intolerance. Now, turn the calendar ahead 60 odd years to the period immediately after World War I. The Ku Klux Klan was busy in Oregon in those years, and one of its targets was the Roman Catholic Church. In 1922, they gathered enough signatures to place on the ballot an initiative that made it a crime in Oregon for parents to send their children to anything other than a public school. The purpose of the measure, of course, was to shut down 
Roman Catholic parochial schools, and the voters approved it by a margin of about 5%. Why? Because Roman Catholics are different from us, and they represent a threat to our way of life. Direct democracy in action again, and again it produced a testament to intolerance. Now turn the calendar ahead another 60 odd years to the late 1980s. Now another group has become active in Oregon politics, proclaiming that another minority group is a threat to our values and our way of life. In 1988, they succeed in placing on the ballot a measure that would repeal an executive order that prohibited state agencies from discriminating in employment on the basis of sexual orientation. The purpose of the measure, as Lon Maybon later explained, was to stifle public discussion of homosexuality. The theory seemed to be that if we don't allow gays and lesbians to identify themselves, maybe, hopefully, they'll disappear. The voters approved the OCA's anti-gay measure in 1988 by about eight percentage points. Why? It was the same old refrain, gay and lesbian persons are different from us, and they represent a threat to our way of life. Direct democracy in action again, and again it produced a testament to intolerance. There's something very wrong in allowing the initiative to be misused in this way. The whole idea of putting minority rights, of putting anybody's rights, for that matter, up for a popular vote is contrary to the very notion, the very purpose of a Bill of Rights. People who are in the majority, after all, don't need constitutional protections for their rights because majorities don't make laws that single out their own beliefs or their own practices for special disadvantage. It is the person who marches to a different drummer who needs constitutional protection for her liberties. It is the person whose skin color or religious beliefs or political philosophy or sexual orientation is different from that of the majority. It is that person who needs the protection of the Bill of Rights. And that's why the US Supreme Court said 50 years ago in a case involving religious liberty for Jehovah's Witnesses, the very purpose of a Bill of Rights was to withdraw certain subjects from the vicissitudes of public controversy and to place them beyond the reach of popular majorities. And that's why the same court in a 1964 case said, a citizen's constitutional rights can hardly be infringed simply because the majority of the people want them to be. And that's why the same court in 1984 said, private biases may be outside the reach of the law, but the law cannot directly or indirectly give them effect. Now it seems to me that all of those principles are violated when initiative measures are placed on the ballot asking people to vote on the question of whether or not the rights of somebody else the rights of a minority group should be restricted or denied. Perhaps the danger would not be so great if the initiative process worked in the way that many of its early proponents thought it would work. There's no need to worry about the tyranny of the majority, some of the framers thought in around 1900, 1910, because the legislature can always act as a safeguard to modify or repeal any excesses of the initiative. But what those early proponents did not foresee, of course, was that sponsors of initiative measures would begin to propose constitutional amendments rather than statutes to further their goals. And by placing their measures in the Constitution, the sponsors prevent the legislature from amending, modifying, or correcting the excesses of these petitions. So what is the solution? I do not advocate elimination of the initiative. Although I think the number of initiatives that have actually been adopted in Oregon that have made any significant contribution to the quality of life in our state in the last 20 years can be counted on the fingers of a man who's lost most of his fingers. <laughs> but there are a number of modifications to the initiative <laughs> process that I believe would improve it and would lessen the danger that it can be used to infringe on the rights of minority groups. Some of these proposals, I want to mention four or five, are alternates to each other, and I list them in no particular order of preference. One possibility would be to provide that statutes 
can be enacted by the initiative alone, but that the Constitution can be amended only by a vote of the people and the concurrence of the legislature. That's the law in several states. A second would be to provide that, yes, the Constitution can be amended without legislative approval, but only if the people approve the amendment in two successive elections, so that the, a proposal could not be carried forward just on the hysteria of one particular political campaign. A third would be to provide that certain sections of the Constitution, those relating to individual rights, could not be amended through the initiative process at all, but only by referral from the legislature. That's the law in Mississippi. A fourth would be to require that constitutional amendments proposed by the initiative would have to be approved by a supermajority of some type, 60%, let's say, or perhaps by an absolute majority of all registered voters rather than simply a majority of those who happen to go to the polls on that particular day. A fifth proposal would require an initiative petition to have a minimum number of signatures from each of the congressional districts in the state before it could qualify for the ballot. Massachusetts and Arizona have laws like that so that the voters in Boston and Phoenix cannot play a dominant and overwhelming role in the initiative process. A sixth proposal would provide for a more proactive role on the part of the Secretary of State in reviewing the constitutionality of proposed measures before they go on the ballot. The Oregon Supreme Court has held that the Secretary of State has a duty to decide whether an initiative deals with one subject, as the Constitution requires, before it can go on the ballot. And there are statements and other court opinions suggesting that the Secretary may have a similar power a similar authority to review proposed measures for compliance with other constitutional provisions. I think the Secretary should exercise that authority. I think the Secretary should refuse to certify measures that are clearly unconstitutional. Court challenges would result, of course, but we have court challenges in abundance under the present system. And it would be very helpful, I think, to have our Supreme Court take a fresh look at this whole question of whether plainly unconstitutional measures, like the ones I have mentioned, excluding black persons from the state, shutting down Catholic schools, eliminating gays and lesbians as full participants in our political processes, whether that kind of plainly unconstitutional measure should even be allowed to go on the ballot in the first place. It's time for a fresh look at that question by our Secretary of State and by the courts, because as it stands now, the integrity of the initiative process is being threatened, being threatened by special interest groups who debase the process with these proposals that come before us time and time again to violate someone else's basic constitutional rights. I believe the Secretary of State can and should play a greater role in preventing that from happening. Well, there are lots of other suggestions floating around. I've just uh, commented on a few of them, and I don't have time to go into any more of them. I want to commend the City Club, however, for sponsoring not only this session today, but for its decision to appoint a committee to look at this whole subject in the coming year, to consider these various proposals, others that may be made, to determine whether or not the time might now be ripe for reconsidering our initiative process, for bringing some measure of, of reform, modification, Let's hope improvement to the whole process. Thank you. The last time I had the pleasure to address you, one of my topics was legislative reapportionment, which I subtitled, How to Lose Friends and Make Whole New Enemies. As the speaker admittedly more sympathetic to Oregon's initiative. I might actually title this, subtitle this speech the same way. That's not to say that I have many concerns. Indeed, the initiative should discomfort even its strongest enthusiasts. It is, after all, lawmaking at its most undiluted, the 190-proof ethanol of politics, not the 80-proof whiskey, wine cooler, or Bud Light of legislative horse trading, deliberation, and compromise. This November, there is a distinct possibility that there will be more initiatives on the ballot than in any year since 1914, before year's end, not to mention two, four, six years hence, 
the initiative could produce in Oregon many of us no longer recognize or are comfortable with. Now, your political ideology may cause feelings of vindication or sheer terror at this prospect. Regardless, it is a truly unsettling and even scary thought. But that's especially why some more historical perspective is so important as we examine honestly what we know and think we know about the initiative to look at our concerns about what it has done, not done, and may yet do. I draw some different conclusions than Mr. Hinkle from such an examination. I come away certainly not an automatic apologist, but also a good deal more than a passive defender resigned merely by legal oath to defend the process, even at times for causes I personally loathe. I think the initiative is being overused, even misused. It needs reform, I'll offer some. But just as strongly, I believe the whole panoply of history shows it doing more good than ill. Yes, it can cater to the least common denominators, try to take away rights. But that is, in fact, all the more reason at this very critical time in Oregon's history to not just look at how it is being used by others, but in a sense to think about how to use the initiative in more and new ways to help Oregonians find and build common ground to become a state we can be proud of. 244 measures in 90 years, about a third successful, an average of seven at each general election since 1978, but no record. Initiatives averaged seven between the two world wars and in the first decade, 15. 1912 saw 28. Only during the 1938 to 76 period, the frame of reference for most of us, was the initiative in relative hibernation, two per year in 1966, none. Through this ebb and flow, what has it brought us? Certainly the trivial and less than profound, the revealing, even the ugly, but in a number of cases, the progressive and even the visionary. Dairy farmers in 1924 initiated an effort to outlaw that great threat to civilization as we knew it then, oleomargarine. Otto Hartwig, head of the AFL-CIO, warned darkly in the voters' pamphlet of the false economy an unhelpful practice of substituting artificial lubricants on bread. <laughs> Labor, he intoned, presumably with a straight face, is fighting for a butter standard of living and not an oleo standard. <laughs> More recently, the initiative has been used by groups vigorously opposed to daylight savings time, like hold traps, monopoly in the making of false teeth, triple trailers. But other initiatives more revealing echo many themes common today. Taxes, certainly not just on property and unimproved land and sales and income, but on railroads, utilities, gasoline, cigarettes, trucks, and oh yes, oleomargarine. Natural resources, the most common over the years has been efforts directed at preserving dwindling fish runs, the first in 1908, long before dams. And that intersection between morality and government, most common here, 46 years in which Oregonians voted a dozen times on alcohol, enacting, then repealing prohibition by initiative and doing many things in between. And ugly? Absolutely. The most successful one, far and away, is the one already referred to, the compulsory school amendment, later overturned by the US Supreme Court. But if we think that the 1923 legislature might have done something much different, it is not just the eerie coincidence that the House Speaker, Casper K. Kubli, had the same initials as the group that brought this initiative but most legislators, and indeed the governor of that year, heartily endorsed the measure. Weighed against these initiatives are those that have forever changed Oregon's landscape and helped us move forward. Everyone's progress list will and should differ, but I'll give you some on my own. The Corrupt Practices Act, the workers' compensation system, direct primary elections, women's right to vote, the eight-hour day, fish protection measures I've mentioned, pollution bonds to clean up the Willamette, basic school support fund, legislative apportionment on one person, one vote, scenic waterway protection, victims' rights, and I'll even surprise some of you by including part of Measure 5 on this list. For doing one thing profoundly right and long overdue, making the state, not local property taxpayers, primarily responsible for financing schools. What I think it did profoundly wrong, provide no alternative financing, remains our biggest challenge as a state. But it took five failed initiatives, a quarter century of legislative failure, before Oregonians finally took action because their representatives were unable or unwilling to do so. 
Other initiatives, though unsuccessful in the short run, have been powerful catalysts for sweeping change. The best example, 1922, the state income tax. It failed. It launched a wild eight-year roller coaster ride that saw a number of other failed initiatives, failed referrals, final success in the Property Tax Relief Act of 1930. Called that because it eliminated the statewide property tax as the main mechanism for financing state government, and indeed was a recognition that taxes should be based on the economy of the present, manufacturing, services, and not on the economy of the past. In that sense, help moved us, moved us forward, just as at key moments in our history. It has also held up a mirror to Oregon and who we are and revealed things that are very, very unpleasant. Some reforms? Absolutely. Let me offer three. Substantially raise the signature requirement for proposed constitutional amendments and perhaps lower that for statutory changes. Seventy percent of the initiatives circulating this cycle were constitutional amendments. I think at least half didn't need to be. However much you like the ideas, there is no good reason that private school vouchers, bans on out-of-district campaign contributions, less in public employee pensions should be inserted into Oregon's already too cluttered framework document. The explanation is obvious. You not only prevent the legislature from doing things, but you also check the Supreme Court from finding it unconstitutional under the Oregon Constitution, perhaps. It's unnecessary. Legislators, if anything, have been notoriously timid about even changing a comma of past initiatives. A 10 or even 12 percent statutory requirement, and perhaps lower the 6 percent to 5 percent for statutory changes, would strike a better balance. Require more signatures to trigger the much of the legal process and getting sued. It takes just 25 signatures today to put all of that in motion, and more and more opponents are suing since there's nothing to lose and only delays to gain. Require initiative to first gain a set number of signatures, perhaps 1 percent of the total, would likely reduce costs, litigation, and weed out marginal initiatives and those filed for news conference value. And third, I personally think it's time to ban the pay per signature bounty system of signature gathering in this state. And since we cannot, and since the U.S. Supreme Court says you cannot ban salaried efforts or ban it completely to regulate them better. Consultants are now saying, in effect, no matter how poorly drafted or even obnoxious your initiative, you pay us enough money, we'll get it on the ballot. It's an invitation to fraud, I believe and a corruption of grassroots democracy into cash-and-carry democracy. Imagine if in the legislature only those bills could be put up for consideration if it was demonstrated that people raised enough money. We're already, in some ways, too close to that given the campaign finance situation. Perhaps even more effective on this score is not any new law, but the resolve of individual Oregonians. Start telling paid circulators, no matter how much I like your idea, I'm with Nancy Reagan on this one. I'll just say no. More fundamental reform, taking initiatives off limits to certain kinds of proposals, the concern about the tyranny of the majority, democratic despotism, minority rights. Yes, they've been with us a long time, although 99% of Madison's writing and the subjects were directed squarely at his big fear of the era, state legislatures trying to deprive minority rights, which to him, in many cases, meant property rights. I respect the argument. It's worth talking about. It's very important. But it leads me to some fundamental cul-de-sacs. If you define fundamental rights, for example, as the U.S. Bill of Rights in Oregon's Article I, take a close look. You'll run the gamut from free speech and equal protection to property rights, capital punishment, and liquor by the drink. If passion is the standard, certain things that have too much passion, who measures that and how? And if in rights are in conflict, arguably segregationists of the 1950s argued that anti discrimination laws to protect African Americans violated their property rights, how do you referee such fights? The thing that is scary about Republican government and that this argument recognizes 
is that any government with or without an initiative ultimately has no fail-safe guarantee of citizens' rights. Initiatives can try to deny rights, but so can legislatures. The 1923 session banned Japanese from owning land. Sometimes initiatives are the bulwark against legislative efforts to deprive rights and rights vice versa. Sometimes both are in it together. Then courts must, if they can, but they can fail too. Remember Dred Scott. The initiative may seem to bring us closer to this abyss at times, this potential of the seeds of destruction within and strip away a line of defense or two but absent the initiative, the abyss is still there. The initiative is not going away, and I actually seriously doubt its use will be significantly restricted in the near future. Even modest changes, much less major, must be approved by the public. And you can speculate on their willingness to sign an initiative restricting initiative petition or vote favorably on a proposal referred by that popular institution, the legislature, which was no less popular than I was a member, by the way. That's why I think it's very important to conclude by focusing on not what the initiative is being used for, but what it is not. For the most part, it has largely been, in recent years, the province of those seeking popular validation for their belief in what constitutes a major evil in society, be it high property taxes, nuclear power, triple trailers, gay and lesbian Oregonians. Noticeably absent have been broad coalition building efforts that propose solutions to unify disparate constituencies and seek common ground. Indeed, almost a glaring passivity, not among conservatives, but mainly among moderates and liberals, who have really spent conspicuously little time to build and promote the agenda. Think for a moment how we would view the question, how you would have answered the question posed initially today. If 1990's ballot measure five had limited property taxes to 1.5%, but also contained new revenues to replace all, most, or even half the shortfall. Or if 1992's defeated Measure 9 had prohibited special rights for gay and lesbian Oregonians, but also prohibited discrimination based on sexual orientation and received 44% approval. Indeed, you just approved a report recommending that. That's a fair question about amendment versus statute, but you were silent on how to enact it. What better vehicle than the initiative for a measure that is simple to understand and very straightforward, but difficult. The signature gathering effort itself would make a virtue of necessity, forcing proponents to organize across the state, build the political infrastructure that is arguably vital and necessary to win such a campaign, and build a base should the effort fall short. Natural resource issues have as much, perhaps greater potential to divide and distract us as, these, as this. Increasingly, our politics here resemble World War I, huge casualties, mounting ill feeling, and little territory gained for either side. What about an initiative, for example, that would re redirect just a penny or two of every five cent bottle deposit to finance up to $300 million to rehabilitate streams for salmon, reforest neglected timberland, fix our parks, work with landowners to protect habitat? Such a green infrastructure initiative could create thousands of jobs, help stave off devastating regulatory consequences, and build common ground among people who right now, quite honestly, are often at each other's throat. Or school finance reform and the road not taken. There are over 300 school districts in Oregon. Cons pick among from concerned parents, teachers, school board members, administrators, business people, citizens. Find just four people in each district, four. Ask them to come together to forge a basic initiative unfettered, I hope, by some of the legislative constraints, and promise to devote 12 hours over a two-year period of time to knock on just 200 doors. Assuming one person per door, just half signing, you have 120,000 signatures. Are we afraid that on issues of such importance we couldn't find enough people, or have we not just yet tried? Bold, audacious, scary. That's the peril, truly, but also the possibility of the initiative as opposed to rep straight representative government. Yes, the OCA may build on people's fears and target Oregon o Oregonians for discrimination, and Don McIntyre and Frank Eisenzimmer may have very conservative agendas. 
but they demand and must be given some due. They have organized. They have relied. In many cases, primarily or exclusively, on unpaid volunteers. They have not simply complained about being locked out. It's useful to recall the fierce argument over one initiative when it appeared on Oregon's ballot for the fourth time in five elections. The proposal, opponents argued, was a frontal assault on the natural rights of a large portion of Oregonians, violated God, nature, and the tradition of Republican government. Every previous effort had failed, and by an increasingly larger margin. This is clearly an abuse of the initiative process, that a measure so often and so recently voted down should be forced on the ballot at every election. The opponent said in the voters' pamphlet, and it lost again by an even larger margin. Yet two years later, there it was again for a fifth time. That time it passed. The year was 1912. It gave Oregon women the right to vote. Oregon politics has never been the same since and we have the initiative to thank for that. We have about 10 minutes for questions, and we'll open the floor now to that. Uh, please use uh, the, either of the microphones and please make your question brief so that we can uh, get as many people as possible and their questions to the speakers. We'll start, as I indicated earlier, with the first question from Diana Smiley, member of the Board of Governors. Thank you. I appreciate the comments of both of the speakers today. I thought they were excellent. My question is, um, if each of you think that the initiative process in Oregon has affected citizens' trust and confidence in our elected government, and if you do, uh, how do you think that has worked? Well, there, do, there doesn't seem to be much uh, confidence in the elected government, but I don't think it has anything to do with the presence of the initiative. Uh, maybe the recall. Uh, is some commentary on that, and the fact that the recall is not used very much in Oregon. I, I don't know if it's ever been used successfully, for at least not in my recent memory. Uh, so uh, that, that safety valve is there, and it doesn't seem to be used. So uh, you know, people who complain about uh, government, uh, again, hold press conferences once in a while, but they don't follow through in terms of, uh, of the mechanism that is there to, to get rid of the elected officials they don't like. I think you see a real mixture. I think some initiatives clearly respond to inaction on, on some issues. Measure 5, uh, recycling that uh, responded to inaction and then failed, but that prompted uh, action in the, in the next legislative session. Other initiatives probably arguably are, are, are organizing tools, uh, ways to get issues before the public, uh, uh, as well as to organize uh, your group. I think the trust in all institutions right now is very, very low. Uh, um, elected officials, uh, and in some ways, uh, uh, yeah, just in elected officials, and that the initiative mirrors that, as opposed to, and I think being a driver of it. Uh, in fact, throughout the history, I'm struck by how the initiative really uh, shows Oregon caught at some turbulent times, the closest being the 1920s. Uh, rapidly changing economy for the first time, most wages now from, from uh, manu manufacturing wages, more than farm income, more people living in cities and counties, immigration, strong nativist sentiments, concern about the breakdown in the 1920s of the family. The divorce rate reportedly was three times higher than the national average here in Oregon. And that you go through cycles and we're in one right now and uh, having the potential of 10, even 15 initiatives in the ballot I think reflect that confusion we feel right now as a state. Dr. Storrs, did you have a question? Oh, sorry, but I know which microphone you're talking to. I'm Muriel Goldman, a member of the City Club. Um, I happen to be someone who for years has been actively involved as a citizen, and I strongly support citizen involvement. I think something has changed now, and uh, although I appreciate the examples that uh, Mr. Kiesling cited of the democratic process, I think the initiative has no longer be, is no longer a democratic process 
because of the entrance of money into it. And those special interests who have the most money can buy the signatures, and that changes the whole picture. And so. Do you have a question? I, yeah, I'm getting okay. to it. And so I would like a response. I, you, Mr. Kiesling, you said that what we, maybe what we need is to get the public to not want to sign those things. It doesn't work that way. And I'd like to know how you feel about uh, not allowing paid signatures uh, for the use of the initiative, and what do you think the chances are of getting something like that passed? As I stated in my speech, I will introduce, push for, as I have in the past, a ban on the pay per signature method. The U.S. Supreme Court has said you can't ba ban paid petition signature gathering entirely. It's a protected form of free speech. But let's have a little historical perspective is interesting. Charlie mentioned it. Until 1935, it not only was legal in Oregon, but it was actually common practice. William S. Uran was a big advocate of it. The Oregonian, uh, not a fan of the initiative at all, often groused about it in editorials. Uh, common rate of pay, five cents a signature in 1914, uh, compared to 35, 50 cents that I think Bill Sizemore mentioned that they were paying for PERS uh, that makes them, you guys look like relative cheapskates and you consider inflation. Uh, money is a part of politics. It's part of representative government, too much so. But we can't get rid of it. We can only try to set some ground rules and strike a better balance. That's what I think banning the bounty system and more regulation on other methods would do. Uh, but ultimately, uh, people can, can speak volumes with their own actions. And I don't think it's at all beyond the pale that an increasing number of Oregonians, uh, perhaps most, eventually will reach the point that they just won't sign no matter how good they think the idea is. And uh, it's something that I, I suggested that they really seriously think about. Dr. Storrs has graciously given uh, way here, so we'll go over to this microphone. My name is Paul Farrago, a City Club member. I'm interested in the initiative in particular. <laughs> as regards the ability of individuals to change the relationship with their governmental institutions. And I'm glad that each of the speakers mentioned the women's right to vote, which proceeded from the initiative. In addition to that, they failed to mention that the direct election of U.S. senators followed from the initiative process, and it was begun here in Oregon. And along the same lines, with regard to the relationship of the individual to the governed, um, term limits, which passed by 70% in 1992, and is arguably the only national issue which, through the ref referendum process uh, since those previous that I cited, has captured national attention, having passed 14 states by two to one in 1992 and slated for the ballot and seven more. Um, that, that reform proceeds from another tyranny of the majority, the tyranny of the... We can have the question because we are running the, Well, the question is then, Mr. Kiesling, uh, there the issue of regulating access to the initiative is coming before the court. Uh, we're talking here about some regulations, but already the question of the restrictions which hold the initiative to a two-year signature collection period and only appearing every other November on the ballot are before the court. And I wonder if you could inform the audience about the source of those regulations and what issues are before the court and before the people of Oregon in that deliberation. <laughs> there are dozens of issues about regulating the initiative before the courts and active court suits. I don't have my attorney present uh, right here, so I always get a little nervous about these questions. But uh, there, is a, there is broad power in Oregon Constitution uh, that has been interpreted that the legislature can regulate the practice. Now, whether the courts will think that a two-year limit is within that power or not, I think that's the question. To date, they have upheld that. Uh, uh, I don't know if you're advocating to allow an initiative to be filed in 1994 and, and be out there circulating to the year 2040 or not, but I think it's appropriate to have some regulations on it, and the courts have generally uh, supported some of those if they feel that it meets certain tests. Um, it, it, there's obviously a lot of other challenges as well. Uh, Charlie, Charlie and I are involved in some litigation on what exactly is a single subject with one. I, it, it adhere to the rule of politics. The first is Dick Newberger's that uh, no matter how strongly you might feel about something, it, you ought to recognize the other guy just may be right. And the second rule, a uh, Kiesling corollary, which is never try to bet on what the Oregon Supreme Court is eventually going to do about anything. Uh, but there's a lot of issues uh, about that, but there is a lot of case law 
that give the legislature some authority to, to, to regulate the practice of the initiative. We'll take these last four if you can meet the challenge of keeping it to 30 seconds. Go ahead. Thank you. Stephen Taylor, City Club member. I think that most of the people in the room would agree that some reform to the initiative process might be appropriate. However, both speakers and some of the questioners have acknowledged the reason that that process exists is that it is a level of protection for individual voters against the legislature. It seems to me that reform of the initiative process would be seen by the voting populace at large as a threat to their direct access to government. Wouldn't we better spend our time in correcting the flaws in the legislative system, particularly campaign finance reform? Wouldn't, we, wouldn't our time be better spent in those efforts? Well, the problem that campaign finance reform has is the same problem about trying to ban paid petitioners. Uh, the First Amendment and the free speech guarantees of the Oregon Constitution generally protect the, your right to spend money in a political election, a campaign, no matter how, in what form you do so. Judge Fry here in Portland had struck down Oregon's ban. Oregon did have a ban on paid petitioners in the early 70s, and the Libertarian Party wanted to hire some paid petitioners to go out to get enough signatures to get on the ballot. It sued and it won, even before the U.S. Supreme Court had, uh, had uh, ruled. So I, I, uh, I appreciate Phil's suggestion there, but I, it was a little short on specifics because the, the Supreme Court has said you can't ban paid petitioners. And most of the campaign finance proposals that have been proposed by Cliff Carlson and others face that same constitutional objection. You cannot ban spending of money. Yeah. Uh, what I advocated is not banning paid signature gathering in general, but banning a specific method, the bounty method, so much per signature as a means of compensation force those efforts to basically make those people employees or independent contracts on a, on a, on a wage basis, a, a salary basis. Uh, it's a good question. There's a lot of constitutional ground here that you may run afoul of. Uh, even that might be overturned. I think, though, it's worth trying and that there's enough daylight to at least pursue that. Uh, similarly, campaign finance reform, I personally agree that's very important, and this is a, actually a very good example. Uh, the last 20 years have seen 10 sessions go by with major efforts asking legislators to change the rules by which those legislators succeeded. And 10 years, 10 sessions have gone by with no major campaign finance reform. Now, whether these recent ideas are good ideas or not, I think it's pretty telling that it, it, it takes, in effect, an initiative drive to get an what, it, what is a very important issue to people out in front of the populace because the legislature has really been unwilling to, to tackle it. And there is going to be one on the ballot this year. Maybe, and maybe two. Uh, maybe two. Over here. Jack Brady, time's wasting, but I suggest that one issue that the two speakers have not really addressed is the question of what has been the impact over the last 50 or 60 years of the initiative and the referendum upon the functioning of the state legislature. And I submit that that is a really fundamental question we need to consider. I think an argument can be made that it has been destructive of focusing the attention upon the, our representatives in a Republican form of government. Thank you. I, I agree with that, uh, Jack. I think it's one way of passing the buck. I, I did not say this in my prepared remarks, but I think it does give the legislature uh, an ability to, to cop out on issues. There are states, after all, a lot of states in the Union that don't have the initiative. Compare Oregon, for example, to Minnesota. Minnesota has never had the initiative. It has, a, has historically had a very progressive and responsive legislature. They make mistakes, so does everyone else. But again, I would submit to you, uh, even though I'm not advocating an abolition of the initiative, I think you'd be hard pressed to argue that Minnesota has a lower quality of life or a lower quality of political dialogue for not having the initiative than Oregon does for having it. Yes. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a City Club member, also on the program committee. My question is this. I believe there is a vast difference between an initiative on oleomargarine and targeting the civil rights of gays and lesbians. As an openly gay man, isn't it time that we simply stop putting civil rights up for a popular vote? Yeah. There's a vast difference. And the initiative has obviously been used for, as I mentioned, both the trivial and the very destructive. The question about whether rights can be subject to a vote really demands us to think about what kind of a vote. Are we saying that rights cannot be put to a vote by anyone, cannot be put to a vote by the other half of the legislative power, which is the Oregon legislature? Courts all the time decide 
that rights have been put to a vote and violated. And in the vast majority of cases, it's because a legislative body has violated those rights and their laws have been declared unconstitutional. Now, this is not an issue to me of desirability. I think anything that puts rights, whether it would be to repeal women's suffrage, whether it is the 1992 OCA measure, really shouldn't be before us. Personally, as a citizen, that's how I feel. But we've got to be, I think, consistent and recognize that in a Republican government, one in which all authority ultimately is vested in the people, and that is the language our Constitution, the federal Constitution, we the people, that while we might want, it to be, want rights never to be subjected to a vote, they have been over and over again in the history of this country. Now, we built mechanisms to safeguard us. Courts are the primary ones, state and federal level. But as I said, courts can fail too. It's not a happy circumstance. But if, if, if we somehow start making distinctions to say certain things are off limits to the initiative, but it's fine for the legislature to do it because they're acting in a very Republican, small r manner, that it would be fine for the 1923 legislature to, to put on the ballot and pass, or to just enact laws that deprive Japanese of their rights to own property, or they could have done the compulsory school bill, or something much worse. Where do we get? Do we get to having courts go in with injunctions on the floor of the Oregon House of Representatives and say, I'm sorry, you can't even consider that one for third reading and final passage. That's just off limits. Ultimately, as Thomas Jefferson said, the only real protection against the rights of everyone in a society is with an educated citizenry and a citizenry that is committed to, to, to that, that, those basic sets of principles. All your laws, your guarantees in the Constitution are important, be lines of defense, but ultimately that's what you have to rely on. Times I wish it were not so, but I just can't see any other alternative, Greg, uh, to do it. Now, courts obviously may, may decide that there's a difference here with how Oregon has gone about doing it. But um, um, it is time to stop doing it. But to say that we, we have to, that it's illegal and that it can't be done, um, that, that's where the logic, I think, doesn't, doesn't quite hold for me. Last question, B.J. B.J. Seymour, City Club member. Uh, would Mr. Kiesling comment on Mr. Hinkle's recommendation six that the Secretary of State be required to um, right. pass on the constitutionality <laughs> right. of a measure right. before it could become an initiative? Right, that, 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 that an executive branch officer in effect performs what is traditionally in this country very much been a judicial function uh, of, of taking something off the ballot uh, in a sense of electoral form of, of prior restraint uh, because it fits a category of that. Again, I know the appeal of this. If there were a way to, uh, to prevent us from going through much of what we've gone through, just as a citizen, I very much applaud it. But again, think about the implications of that. This office deciding up front, not just whether something violates a basic right about equal protection, but whether there's a free speech right, a property right, a liquor by the drink issue, because that's in Article I of the Constitution as well, uh, that any constitutional question, not just the very narrow ones of single subject, become fair game for me reviewing. Who would not ask the Secretary of State to rule on the unconstitutionality of a measure they don't like? whether it's triple trailers, leg hole traps, bear baiting, PERS initiatives, you name it. Think about whether you want to give that power to an office such as mine, whether I'm in it or somebody else. Think about that very long-standing principle in jurisprudence that says that you don't want courts giving advisory opinions ahead of time on the constitutionality of measures, that you do it only afterwards. And again, I just don't think appealing as it is superficially, I think the questions that it raises are, are, are profound and far more troubling, in effect, than, than what it is that, that, that you're trying to, trying to solve. Well, the problem with what Phil says is that the courts have already mandated the Secretary of State to make that determination on some issues. 
and why not have the Secretary of State do it? What's wrong with that office? It's an elective office. If we don't like what he does, we can boot him out at the next election. But recall me. But, <laughs> but, but the Supreme Court has already said that when Portland voters put on the ballot an initiative petition to change the name of Martin Luther King Boulevard back to Union Avenue, the Oregon Supreme Court said that the elections officers should not put it on the ballot, and they kept it off the ballot. And they said the elections officers, not the courts, should make that decision. I don't think that's an awfully hard decision to make. You can ask me, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kiesling, Mr. Hinkle, thank you for a very high level of dialogue. You've set a high standard for our own look at the initiative. Thanks also to the Research Board and the Program Committee for bringing this meeting to us today. We're adjourned.